There are more than 100 unique styles of beer, each with their own set of ingredients, process, guidelines, history, and experience. If you're a beer lover, an industry leader, or somewhere in between, a better knowledge of beer style will improve your life and your work. Welcome to A Sense of Beer Style, essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. I'm Julia Herz. And I'm Jeremy Storden. We're advanced Cicerones, beer judges, home brewers, and we're excited to guide you through the vast and wonderful world of beer styles. Welcome back to The Sense of Beer Style. Welcome back to my my fantastic guest and friend in beer, Julia. And uh, today we're going to talk about, uh, this is a fun beer style. This is a beer style born from a region, and that's, and I, I love the region. And for those of you who don't know, the region I'm talking about really is the northwest of the United States, but that also kind of includes parts of California part and, and all of the coastal area of of Canada. And and what I'm referring to is this this idea that's out there about a region called Cascadia. And that is a, uh, you know, we're kind of defined by trees and coastal fog and and flannels and fantastic beer. Well, um, somewhere in the 2000s, 2010s, it really got popular. But someone thought, hey, why don't I take this porter that I love and combine it with an IPA that I love? And that's what gave us that black IPA, also known as the CDA, which is short for Cascadian Dark Ale, right? So that that's that's the quick background story. Um, this is, we love our dark beer. We love our hops. What do we do? We put them together and voila, a new style is born. So that is the CDA. Uh, Julia, before you dive into ingredients, you want to add anything to that? You have a, a, a great uh, background in history and, and the history of these I'll beers. just say that it's a murky history at best because, for example, in Colorado, <laughs> where my first introduction to this wasn't the origination from the Northwest in Vermont, but Avery Brewing Company had a New World Porter. Um, and they kind of uh, evolved it marketing wise to be even called a black IPA. So new, so the so the yeah. kind of not even robust porter because that is a very specific style. But there's a there's a mm-hmm. black IPA that kind of woke up one day and it went to bed as a a Americanized <laughs> robust porter. So my experience was discovering that, and frankly, I remember sitting for Master Cicerone. And one of the beers that I had after was Stone Sublimely Self Sublimely Self Righteous, which I I wish they yeah. still made. I don't think they still make it. And I think they still make that like on one occasion. Offs, yeah, sure. And you're seeing all market. sorts of things yeah. coming back. What goes around comes back around. But boy, did that and the Avery New World Porter that really then later got called a black IPA just just stop me in my tracks, right? And so we're going to talk about sensory of why it, it grabbed my attention and my mind and my palate so much because they're so full of flavor and yet they're they're not viscous and dense and oh, oh man though, they're the best combination of many ingredients. So yeah. Absolutely. And it's funny you you mentioned um you know we talk about New England IPAs. Uh, but you know, not all of them are made in New England or even the East Coast. So therefore we call them hazy IPAs or juicy IPAs. And so same thing with this. This kind of began on the West Coast and ironically in the Northwest and in the Southwest and South Southern California. But you know, if we're making this in New Jersey, for example, we're not going to call it a Cascadia because who who knows what that means? It's a black IPA. Um but you know that's that. So, uh, will you talk to us about the ingredients? And I'm gonna I'm gonna prep for. Uh, I will, and I mean, you can make the argument of Cascadian dark is paying attention to the Pacific Northwest hops, and then black ale uh, IPAs are really going for not worrying about maybe those hops. So there is a difference there. Um, I'll also say I call the Beer Judge Certification Program 2021 Style Guidelines in this case a little sloppy. Right, Jeremy and I, I, I'm not just Jeremy's guest, I'm his co-host, and what we've got going on here is overviewing the BJCP style guidelines one style at a con- time, sense of beer style, that's what we do. And so in this style um, of Black IPA, the BJCP guidelines basically don't even talk about the yeast, they don't talk about the base malt, um, it's a little sloppy, right? So I'm going to fill in the blanks, BJCP, you're very welcome. 
Um, and I, I all due respect, I'm kind of joking because what, what a great job and body of work it is. But it doesn't, if you were to read this blind and, and be beginning at like, what am I supposed to use yeah. to brew this or don't know how to fill in the blanks, it's, a, it's got some holes. So if you happen to be watching us and you're not missing out because I'll describe it, Jeremy's holding up his glass and there is an essence of a cholera foam that's affected by the ingredients, that debittered roast malts that I'm talking about, where it's tan, right? And that indicates often um, debittered roasted malt or unroasted malted barley that's been added. Um, the guidelines talk about any um, American or New World hops because an emphasis from the style when we get into sensory and flavor and aroma is the actual hops that have been added. It's not just the bitterness from hops. It's the aroma and flavor. Um, and we want you know you to remember this is an ale. Like If anyone's fermenting this with a lager yeast, I'd be surprised. Sure, go for it. But classically, um, black IPAs or India pale ales, there's a reason that that last word's there is because it's ale yeast. So I think that's really just a quick high level ingredient uh, shakedown on the BJCP style guidelines overview. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, it, it's been a long time since I've had to think about this, but debittered malt, uh, it makes me think that uh, it's uh, the husks have been removed to get rid of that that bitterness, that astringency that could come with that. And, you know, kind of like if you uh, have uh, corn uh, still in the husk and you put it on the barbecue to cook the corn, it's like, well, the husk is going to be <laughs> a bit burnt. Do I? You, you do absolutely I do. That You're still going to get tannins, though, yeah. which okay. is an essence of the mouthfeel from the hops and from the pale malt, and and a little bit probably creep from the debittered malt. But yes, that makes sense and it's a great description. Yeah. So let's talk about the appearance. You you already talked about uh, why the the foam on this is just this beautiful tan color. Um, uh, but that I'm just going to say that's what we can expect. The 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 color of the beer is going to be a very dark brown to black. It's a black IPA. We expect it to be very very dark. So check on that box. We've got that one uh, cornered. Um, if you have a thin glass where you could actually see through it or shine a light, uh, it should. Most styles are going or most versions of the style are going to be clear. If there's a little bit of a haze to it, that's totally acceptable as well. You mentioned the uh, tan foam. Uh, it, it's uh, beautiful. It's a it's a very nice light uh, khaki color for your like your your summer chinos. Uh, but the but the foam should persist. It should. I mean, the one that I had, uh, I poured this probably what um, we're eight minutes into this uh, podcast. I think I poured it about three minutes in. Uh, I still have a good uh, column of foam on this, and it was it was moussey. It it was. Uh, persistent and it just lasts for a while. And and I just absolutely love that. That's what I would expect out of a black IPA. Let's talk about the aroma. Yes. And I'm already getting thirsty. And so aroma after appearance <laughs> really brings your mind to the, to the party of, Hey, I'm about to sip something, but you want to, you want to sell it, smell it first, get a sense of the aroma. Um, so moderate to high hop aroma. I did mention this style is centric on hops. It is a variant of India pale ale. So hello, it is going to have that. And that's what the aroma should lead with. Um, and that's the, you know, new world and American hops, uh, style guidelines talk about stone fruit, citrusy, resin, pine, berry. You've heard if you listen to this show, me talk about the tropics and the forest. I feel like American hops either bring that tangerine, you know, guava, uh, passion fruit type of citrus or the the juniper pine spruce type of notes. So you're looking for that in a um, moderate to high sense in the aroma. Um, low to moderate um, malt flavor because it's going to take a back seat in the aroma. It's harder to smell and that actually the debittered um, malts that are used, they're not going to do as much for the aroma as they will for the flavor and the appearance. So you're not really going to get a punch you in the face type of aroma on the malt, even though people that might see the beer from a distance are like, that's a dark beer. That's going to be all malt centric. So not true in this case leads with hops in the aroma. But then when you do get like that, yeah. you know, low to moderate sense of the malt, it's everything from coffee to toffee to maybe a little bit of light, um, low cacao chocolate, not necessarily as dark, you know, 75%, 80% cacao, not that, but more lighter, um, milk chocolate to, to light, dark chocolate. Um, coffee and, and the like. So you're getting, I think, a nice array of es expression from malt, which is nice. And then you might get some fruity esters, just a little bit from that ale yeast, but it's not a dominant aspect of the of the beer. Yeah. 
and, and all of that translates into the flavor really, really well. Uh, and, and which is fairly common, not, not always, but, uh, this is pretty common. Basically I, I could say as far as flavor goes, I could say what she said. Uh, I, I always evaluate the beer, uh, the same way every time I go to malt first with this one, uh, there, there is a prominent malt undercurrent through this beer style, even though it's a hop forward, hop dominant style it's a, it's a dark beer. It's meant to be, uh, have all those flavors that you would expect out of a dark beer, but the prominence of that, uh, of the malt will be low to medium. Uh, you, you can have a little bit of caramel. You can have a little bit of toffee, uh, dark chocolates, dark coffee, dark espresso, and you can have just a little bit of delightful roasted flavor, but never a harsh roasted, burnt, acrid flavor. That is inappropriate. And, and I've had some that were basically a stout, a highly hopped stout version, and dry as a bone. And it it was uh, it was aggressive. It was it, it was uncomfortable. And 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 my flavor memories are not fond of those particular beers that I had. Uh, it should be uh, just delightful. It should be it should warm you from the inside out on a cool Cascadian Northwest day, right? Um, but that's, that's the malt. Let's, uh, you can have some esters that come through this. This is an ale. So you can have some of those just beautiful, uh, fruity flavors that come through, uh, maybe a light, dark fruit more so, uh, kind of on the fence between, is it, is it fruit? Is it caramel? I'm not sure. That's the ester that I'm looking for in this type of beer. Now we get to the hops. Uh, we're looking for a, a medium low to a high hop flavor, and that's quite a range. But all the flavors you just mentioned, all the American style hops, which runs the gamut these days from pine to forest to uh, to tropical fruit, stone fruit, melon, uh, resin, all this stuff. It's just beautiful. And it, and it but when they talk about the uh, ingredients, you know, like you brought up earlier, they want the malt and the hops to be in harmony. They don't want them to contrast. They don't want this this like a Northern brewer that we talked about in the California common where it's just, it's just lumbery and, and piney and citrusy or not citrusy, but uh, resiny. They don't want that to contrast with the flavor. They want to fit in with each other really well. They want them to get along. Um, the bitterness out of this, we've got a uh, dark malt in this that is potentiating that, uh, that bitterness from the hops. So we're looking at from a moderately high to a very high bitterness so if you're one who uh, does not like bitterness in any form, this may not be the beer for you, but I urge you to try it nonetheless, just so you know it. Um, because of these darker grains, because of this, you can uh, get a little bit of this a drier finish. Uh, they t- don't typically uh, uh, attenuate poorly. They typically go all the way through with a little bit behind. Um but get kind of finishing up on that bitterness and that uh, and the roastiness and the whole the whole of the beer is it should be delightful. Maybe it challenges your palate a little bit, but it should fit. It should be smooth. It should be enjoyable. Uh, and that caps it all off with if you get a stronger version of this, then you may have a little alcohol warmth. Um, it, it's not a it's not a easy forgettable beer. It's a very memorable beer. Uh, so just make sure you're in the mood for it. Uh, uh, how about the mouth? Great segue, Jeremy, because you mentioned the word smooth and the style guidelines points that mm-hmm. out. Um, again, kind of talking specialty IPA, uh, black IPA as one of the variants, you want it to be smooth. You mm-hmm. do want it to be balanced. So on the mouth feel or kind of how it feels on your, your tongue and soft palate, um, it's not going to have heavy, dense body, medium, light to medium body. That's reasonable. And I love that. It's, it's, I could have actually two or three of these over the course of many hours and not feel like it just weighted me down. Um, medium carbonation is appropriate. It's not aggressive. It's not light. That's going to help dry it out though. We do want the carbonation to be present. Um, a light creaminess is optional. It could be creamy, could be a little so smooth that it's silky, right? Um, and then Jeremy talked about kind of the ethanol or alcohol and, and a light warming from that alcohol, mm-hmm. depending on where it lands in the spectrum of the ABV for the style, um, could be there, right? So you might get on the mouthfeel a little prickle from the alcohol if you're paying attention. One thing I, I want to mention, I noticed in the current uh, the guidelines that we're using, the 2021 guidelines, it, it used to talk about a little bit of low astringency, in, and that has been removed from the 2021 guidelines. 
Uh, that's where I kind of disagree respectfully again as well, because we've got some dark grains. We've got a lot of hops. It's kind of hard to avoid a little bit of astringency. Uh, so uh, frankly, I would I would allow a little bit of that drying effect after I'm done, especially with a lighter body uh, or uh, a lighter finish, excuse me, drier finish. Uh, they may have in, intended to include that. It's not included, but I want to point that out specifically that, you know, you're fact is you're going to get a little bit of astringency out astringency yeah great out of this. addition for sure yeah uh thank you the uh style comparison let, let, you know i uh, we could compare this to to uh, other uh, like an american ipa it's going to be darker more roasty we could compare this to a porter or a stout it's not going to be quite as roasty uh and it's definitely i'm going to use the b word not quite as burnt as some stouts can be uh, but it's definitely going to have a lot more hop character, hop flavor, hop bitterness added to that. Uh, and so while those may be cousins, they're not siblings. I think a a good way to think about this beer, a good style comparison would be to, and and you know me and my, and my romance with beers, imagine an American IPA went to Germany and met a beautiful Schwartz beer and, and they had a love child and that would be this black IPA. Right. So a Schwartz beer, it's clean, it's dark, but it's friendly. It's not burnt. It's not aggressive. It's just it's just dark and delightful. That's what this black IPA, in my estimation, experience ought to be. So that's style comparisons. How about uh, commercial examples? Well, you, we brought up uh, sublimely self-righteous. You're saying that it's still made. I love it. And if yep. 2021 guidelines are actually using that as a commercial example, it means it's still around in some form. That's from Stone Brewing out of San Diego, California. Um, and it's, it's a great existition. I totally forgot about and no um, uh, no fault on the brewery. They're there. Um, 21st Amendment, Back in Black, is one of the actual – you can find that. So go seek that out. Uh, 21st Day out of San Francisco, California. Great brewery. Oh, my gosh. California, born and bred and – what great people behind that brewery and a, and a really neat um, example. Duck Rabbit out of North Carolina and the Carolina area. Forgive me, it might be South Carolina, but in the Carolinas. Um, Hoppy Bunny. And I love that it's a smaller brewery because Duck Rabbit's not even widely distributed, but their list is having the Hoppy Bunny as a commercial example as well. And, and uh, of all the, when, when this style was in its heyday in the, in the uh, late 2000s and early 20 teens, uh, there were a lot of other really great options out there. And maybe, just maybe, you'll see those as a one-off, as a, hey, remember this beer type of thing. Or, or maybe your local uh, uh, craft brewery will say, hey, we want to try that style too, just to kind of tap our foot on the base. Um, that's where I was able to find these samples is, you know, that, that was in a competition and some people submitted their black IPA. Uh, so they still exist. They're just hard to find. And commercially not as well received. So brewers aren't going to brew them as much anymore, but that's, if you can find them, great. If you not, then brew them yourself. Uh, that's my PSA for the homebrewers, right. Julia. Yeah. You're brew on. You can do it. You can. <laughs> brew on. Um, so let's talk about the numbers and the vital stats. Uh, so in, in another style cast, we talked about the American IPA as like that, that base, uh, for the American IPA style. And then you have all these iterations of like the red, the white, the Belgian, and the black. Uh, so you can look at those uh, and, and compare them uh, numbers-wise, the vital stats-wise, you can compare those. And so when we talk about ABV, the American uh, uh, IPA, and I'm going to pull this from memory, so please forgive me if I have it slightly off, but was five and a half to seven and a half ABV. This black IPA starts at five and a half and can extend all the way up to nine they actually will make some quite strong versions of this. And so just know that, you know, it's still in the IPA world. We're still tracking with all the numbers, but this one takes uh, a big jump at the higher end of ABV. When we talk about IBUs, uh, if we're talking 50 to 70 would be an, an average range in, in IPA world. This one, the, the IBUs pretty much follow the ABV on this one. It goes from 50 to 90. And again, a huge jump in IBUs, even outside the norm of IPA world. Uh, when we get to the color, this one's a pretty much a slam dunk. Uh, for SRM world, we're looking at uh, 25, which is uh, solidly brown, up to 40, which is just jet black. Uh, if you're an EBC or European Brewery Convention type of uh, person, then we're looking right around 50 to 80. We effectively double that. 
uh, and kind of heading back into uh, uh, ABVs, it's all related to uh, gravity or Plato. Uh, in that, when you know, brewers is uh, starting to uh, boil their beer, they're going to take a measurement of the original gravity to find out how much sugars and solute is in this uh, solution. Uh, and that's going to help them get an idea of how much it attenuates or uh, ferments down, and they'll take their uh, uh, ABV out of that. Uh, so the original gravity, we're looking at uh, 1050 to uh, 1085 if you're a gravity person, or 12.5 to 21 if you're a Play-Doh person. And that just lets you know how much potential, uh, that how strong this beer could be. When we get to final gravity, again, uh, Julia, I think you and I are the same sound uh, mind and body on this one. This one's more important because that lets me know what my beer drinking experience is going to be. Above 1010, it's got some body. This one uh, finishes uh, on average from 1010 to 1018. So this can have some body. It can have a dry finish, but it can still have some body. And those are two very different things. If you're, uh, again, if you're a Play-Doh person, this is going to be uh, finish at two and a half to four and a half, uh, right around there. And if you don't like ABV, you prefer uh, Play-Doh as far as uh, what your strength is going to be. We're looking at about 10 to 16 and a half. Uh, so these are the numbers. Uh, take a look at those. Understand what these numbers mean. If you don't remember, go back to our prep episodes and compare these numbers with similar styles uh, so you can see how they overlap and how they differ from each other. And that's just an incredible education. Uh, but let's talk about glass and temp. So now. we're in the IPA India Pale Ale land. And, and the most common glass that you do see these yeah. enjoyed out of are, are American style pint glasses. Uh, Jeremy and I are, are proudly drinking our water um, out of those, but I'm not putting my IPA in that. It's okay. It's just not going to showcase as the brewer intended. It's going to mute some of the flavors. Uh, the beer collar foam is not going to be as supported. There's just a lot of reasons that I don't want to use a cocktail shaker glass for my everything in beer. Uh, so, you know, your classic standby would be everything from a Belgian tulip to a Nonick shaker pint to a Willie Becker German style glass, something that's that's got some, you know, height to it and, and girth. Jeremy's holding up the Willie Becker and and yet allows you to put your your um, hand around the glass if you want to warm up the beer. And in, in this case, because of the debiggered malts, it's nice to warm this up a little bit, right? It really is. Uh, or you can put your hand yeah. around the bottom um, uh, base of the beer. It doesn't have a stem and a foot, but it has a, a heel, kind of a, a base. So that's a thicker glass um section of the glass. And so less heat is transferred. So you can strategically hold this to not warm it up as fast. So that's what I would do with the Willie Becker, um, for sure. Or the Nonick pint. Um, and then I love the idea of, uh, um, temperature and serving, uh, discussion because it's relevant and something that does have expression of darker roasted malts. I would want that to be a little warmer. I don't want this full cellar temperatures of, of 45 to 55 degree Fahrenheit, but I don't want this 38 degrees either, you know, 45 degree Fahrenheit. Um, and I'm now at a loss for my Celsius conversion. Uh, Jeremy could probably help. But I would love to have it at 45 degrees. It's not too cold. It's not too warm. And it's going to showcase and express itself the best at that temperature. Yeah. And, you know, for the Celsius conversions, when it comes to beer temp, it, it's kind of, uh, for me, I, I simplify things. And that's how I learn. And so when I think about, uh, you know, uh, for a Fahrenheit from 40 to 50 degrees is that sweet spot for beer in, in my estimation. So when we convert that to uh, Celsius, it's basically four to 10 degrees. And so, you know, if you're saying you want that right in the middle of the Fahrenheit uh, beer range at about 45, I, I could just say let, let's put that in seven or eight celsius and uh six to eight celsius and, and yep, we call it love good. it so what about beer pairings jeremy yeah. you know I, I i always uh i love it when you go first because you are the master but this one uh i i gotta say I, i'm feeling pretty good about my beer pairings on this one uh this is not the beer that i gravitate toward uh first on a friday night but I have had some wonderful experiences with this beer style, um, particularly when I'm when I'm uh, enjoying these dominant flavors of that roast, that uh, chocolate, that coffee, and the hops. I'm thinking I want something a little bit creamy, like a. a but um, you know, I, I mentioned you know this is this is a cross between an IPA and a short beer, so I'm thinking German. I want some herbed, herbed spetzel with some braised pork ribs in, in a like slightly creamy sauce. Um, I love uh, dark roasty beer with mac and cheese, uh, New England, New England clean, uh, clam chowder. Um, 
And another one I, I think that would be fantastic with this would be like a black truffle and cream gnocchi and finished off with a coconut flan. I would have the same beer with both of those all the way through. And and that's where I, I think I'd be happy. Wow, Jeremy, you are the master there. It, fantastic pairings in my view. I can see a lot of them. And I love forcing ourselves in not just beer studies to talk about why food and beer have synergy. Uh, on my mind, besides chocolate truffles, so you nailed it there, because there's a there's a there's a dense nuance, a dense delicacy to to truffles, right? And when chocolate, not mushroom. Um, although it'd be interesting to try this with mushrooms, mm-hmm. frankly. Um, I'm gonna add mushrooms to the dish, I'm gonna say in a second because of that notion. But I like chocolate truffles because the the beer carbonation is kind of gonna lighten the the truffle, scrub the tongue a little bit, and then the um essence of chocolate is going to marry and bridge over certainly to the deep bittered uh roasted malt for sure. So you're gonna have a lot of synergies and also uh mouthfeel wise, it's gonna be a little more palatable to have that truffle with your black IPA. Yeah. Well, and 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 just to just to clarify a little bit, I, I was talking about those actual black truffles. The 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 oh okay, mushroom, so you were uh, going to the mushrooms. The, yeah, the, I the see fun, it. I, I was I was going I was going I was going fungus among us. Uh, the black truffle with the cream gnocchi, just because if you think about it, uh, the dominant flavors in this beer have a have a uh, uh, unexpected but delightful bridge to a black truffle, the fungus black truffle. And, uh, and that kind of helps tie those together a little bit too, but, uh, but black truffle and chocolate truffle, you know, we're all, <laughs> we're all in a, having a good so day. So I'm going to go with the, the, the mushroom truffle, the black truffle and put that in what I would have suggest, which is, um, shrimp and grits, right? What a classic <sighs> dish. You know, oh, yeah. you've got this maize, the, the corn is the grits, and uh, I mean, some English bitters use maize, maize is an adjunct for old ale, like uh, corn and fermenting with some lagers for sure. Like there's that essence, there's like a really nice, I think, marriage with corn um, and that maize flavor, and then going towards, uh, I think the hops would almost act like herbs on top of the grits, right? The Think of especially yeah. if they go towards the forest. And then the shrimp to me, shrimp is so good because it's not fishy, right? Shrimp, I, good fresh shrimp in, in forgive, so respect everyone's dietary preferences. Um, but I certainly eat shrimp, a lot of it uh, over my years. And and <laughs> good shrimp has a, a, a not too chewy, but a good texture and give to it. And then it also has a flavor that I think would benefit from not just the grits, which are there to complement it, and the cream, right, the cream grits, but also I, I feel like oh. the beer, right? The, the malt in that beer, the ethanol in that beer, maybe even the hops in that beer. So I see a lot of, a lot of marriage with, um, uh, you know, shrimp and creamed grits for sure. And I'm going to then put the black truffles in that on top of the grits along with the shrimp. And that's going to bridge everything together and be, got, become that like final glue and um, kind of catalyst for like, oh, yeah. Now we're really humming. So that pairing came from both Jeremy and I because Jeremy inspired the addition of the black truffles. <laughs> this is my favorite part of the show. It's just talking about what we're what we want to eat someday when we finally get together in person. Anyway, that's the show on Black IPA, aka the Cascadian Dark Ale. Now we have a little bit of uh, regional history as well as a better understanding of the beer style that that uh, is not as prominent as it used to be, but certainly an incredible pairing if you find one. Um, So thank you for listening. I will add that if you are actually listening and you're doing your beer studies, this style guidelines don't mention beer and food pairing. That's why we deliberately add it because it's about the beer service and most of the time we're enjoying beer with food. So start to force yourself, challenge yourself to try to describe what works with the beers that you're trying. And so hopefully that component in addition in your sense of beer style studies and, and the show listening is helpful to you. But I, I leave every episode thirstier than when I started, whether I have a beer or not, and also <laughs> hungrier than when I started. So I'll leave it with that and, yeah, and cheers to sure. you all. Thank you for listening to A Sense of Beer Style, the essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. With advanced Cicerones, me, Julia, and me, Jeremy. Tune into the next episode as we continue exploring the world of beer styles and what to make of them. We encourage you to listen to the prepisodes to build your foundation and better understand beer styles. And before the next episode, I'd like to ask you to review the show and let us know what you'd like featured in upcoming episodes. Until next time, here's to you and your sense of beer style. 
Thank you for listening. Cheers. Cheers.